Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son will reveal him to. Uh, so he said, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Other translations say, learn of me. Learn my life. Learn my lifestyle. Learn everything about me. And he said, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. I pray that the Lord will help us to see reasons why we should come and always come to Jesus and learn of him. You know, the reason why we connect all the time here every Saturday is to keep coming because that statement is present tense. He said, come, come. If you go back to read that scripture again tomorrow, it is still saying, come. So we cannot be tired of coming to him. We must keep coming to him. We must keep coming to Jesus because all things have been delivered unto him. So no matter what it is that we are trusting the Lord for, Jesus is the key. Uh, so we need to trust him. We need to depend on him. We need to lean on him so that uh, whatever it is that we're looking for, even when we're searching to know God, the Bible says Jesus is the express image of God. So once you look unto Jesus, you will see God. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, today we're going to be taking a short interlude uh, before we continue our series on the blessed are the peacemaker uh, next week, if the Lord permits. Uh, but we feel that we want to take this interlude to kind of give us uh, an overarching focus of what we're doing here. And this, the title of this message says, Giving Attention even unto the Lord. Let's uh, sit back and ready to take our note as we turn to our brother who will be bringing us the message for today. Over to you, sir. God bless you. Hunger for you. Creating our souls a test to know Jesus, to learn Jesus. And to become conformed to his great our Father, create in our hearts, Lord, and for you. us, create our souls in our lives to, to know Jesus. Jesus. Open our understanding, O oh God, to learn Jesus. Jesus. A clear expectation and to conform to the way we must embark on this particular task. Ask Lord that you give us not as a mere routine and overview of what you want to do with our lives. Open our understanding, O oh God, give us. A clear expectation of why we must embark on this particular study. Not as a mere routine that we may study and know Him. The Bible says, For knowing Him is eternal life. Please help us as we go ahead studying. Please undertake for us. In Jesus Christ's name, we have prayed. Amen. The invitation the Lord Jesus Christ gave. Say, so come unto me, all ye that labor and are every lady, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my body is light. Now, if I want to start you to look at that passage very quickly, we hear Jesus Christ who is speaking with authority, is speaking with absolute confidence, is completely in charge. And look at what he said. Say, come unto me. Come unto me. And many times people come to programs, people come to meetings, people even come to church, but they have not come to Him. Many times it is possible to come to Christianity, 
but you have not come to Christ himself. Many times it is possible to come to programs. Many times it is possible you have come to doctrines. And there are many people that are, you know, completely absorbed with doctrines. They may even be biblical doctrines, but they have not come to him. Sometimes you have come even to Bible. As wonderful as the Bible is, and you have not come to him, you have missed it altogether. That's the trouble that the scribes and the Pharisees had. They have the Bible, they have the Word of God, they have the law, but for whom the law was written, for whom the scripture had been written, when he came, they did not recognize him. So my prayer is that God will help you individually to come to the person of Jesus. To come to Jesus, who is God's answer to every need. Jesus is God's solution to every challenge, every problem. And unless you come to him, honestly speaking, you have not come. And so the rationale of taking a whole year or even years to study Jesus in order to come to him, I want to say to you is not monotonous. Actually, for all my own life, there's nothing else to study if it is not this man Jesus. There's nothing else to talk about if it is not this Jesus. And perhaps I must tell you that God has no other message and for the generation and for our world apart from Jesus. So let me ask you to check that very quickly from the book of Hebrews chapter 1. It said, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Now I want you to note that when he used the word he has spoken to us by his son, it's not just that Jesus Christ, God has used him as the preacher. That's not just in terms of, oh, God is speaking to us through Jesus Christ. Or he's using his mouth to talk to us. Even though that is correct, that is all right. That is all right. But is there something beyond that here? In that he said, he has in these last days spoken to us by his son. That is to say that Jesus is God's means of conveying his heart to us. Jesus is God's audiovisual by which we could hear God clearly. Jesus is the one by whom God is conveying his heart <laughs> unto us in these last days. I want every one of you to know that if you will pursue this Jesus with all your heart, and you will commit yourself to it, listen to me, because sometimes some of you might be imagining that we need not be monotonous when are we going to talk about miracles, when are we going to talk about uh, this, when are we going to talk about that. We are asked because many times people talk about topics. God is not talking about topics. God is speaking to us by His Son. God is speaking to us by the personality of Christ. And so when you intend to actually know God and experience the power of God in your life and experience the grace of God for your life, you have no other message to look at. You have no other person to listen to. You must allow God to speak to us by His Son, whom He has appointed the heir of all things.
by whom he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself poured our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Permit me to ask you to wait a bit because while I will be looking at this Jesus, the first thing that is very critical is to be talking about who this Jesus is. What is compelling reason why you must give attention unto this Jesus and why it must become central in our concern, in our study, in our meetings, in our programs, in our worship. Why it is not just that we just mention his name as an addendum. We just don't use his name to end a prayer. The truth of the matter is that God has spoken to us in these last days by his son. And who is this his son? Now look at that scripture quickly. Who is this Jesus by whom God is speaking to us? Let me quickly note with you just on that passage before we go ahead. He said, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. Please, all of you take note of this. He has been appointed as the heir, as the owner, as the possessor. As the one that has the right of all things. Of all things. So if you need anything at all, if you want to collect anything from God, there is one that God had put in charge of all things. And if you did not come for him to sign and put his name on what you're looking for, you cannot get it. Anything else that you are looking for anywhere, if he has not signed it, approved it, or recommended it to the Father, you are not in any position to collect anything. So when he said, come unto me, who is the me? Because you see, when someone says, come to me, the first person says, who are you? Who are you? That you are saying we should come to you. Come unto me. Who are you? So let's quickly look at who he is. Who is this Jesus? He said he has in this last day spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. This is not the first time you are going to meet that word, heir of all things. If you go back into Romans chapter 8, you will notice that he is the heir. If you go to John chapter 3, you will notice that the Bible says God loves the Son and he has put all things in his hands. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son has not life, but the wrath of God is hanging on that man's neck. So, permit me to note with you this moment. He said, Whom he has appointed heir of all things. All of you please take note of that. There is nothing that is not in his hand. We are going to confirm that as I go ahead. There is nothing that you can get and you are not going to get it from the hand of Jesus. Anything that you did not collect from Jesus... It's not authentic. It cannot last. In fact, you become sand in your eyes. Anything that it is not Jesus that releases it to you, it's a stolen good. It's a stolen good. And I dare say to you, it's going to bring you into bigger problem in life and in the world to come. Whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. 
So let's look at when he said this Jesus. He is the one by whom the whole scheme of creation were made. And the Bible said, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power where he had by himself purged our sins sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. He is the brightness of God's glory. He is the express image. Some said he is the perfect imprint of his person. So if anybody says, look, I want to know God, I want to know God. There is no other way you can ever know God. The invisible God. Unless you will look at Jesus. Because Jesus is the express image of the personality of God. Everything you can know about God. Everything you can see in God. God has made it possible for us to see that, but in Christ Jesus. So even if we take 20 years exploring Jesus, exploring Jesus, studying Jesus, and all of us, we have one determined purpose, that we will know Jesus, that we will look for this Jesus. You are not doing anything wrong at all. You are only being reasonable. He said he is the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. is the one upholding all things by the word of his power. He is the one that God had placed to uphold all things, I say, by the word of his power. Now, when he had purged our sins by himself, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on earth, being made so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now, this Jesus, we don't compare him with any angel. He is not in the rank of angels at all. Between Jesus and the highest of angels, there is an infinity of height. There's an infinity of years. Whereas all angels were created by him. He himself is uncreated. Before angels were, he had been there from everlasting to everlasting. From infinity to infinity, he has been God. Anything that God is, exactly is what Jesus is. Actually, everything that makes God God, essentially, is Jesus. So the Bible said, be made so much better than the angels. By inheritance, he has obtained a more excellent name than they. Unto which of the angels said he at any time that had my son this day have I begotten thee? And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he says, And let all the angels of God do what? Worship him. So let's take note that all angels, said, so let all the angels of God, let them worship him. So you don't contrast him with angels, and that's why you don't begin to worship angels in any sense. You don't begin to call the name of an angel when Jesus Christ is seated in your life. You don't continue to refer and allude to angels. What is angel? The Bible says there is ordinary ministering spirits that are sent to minister to those of us that are heirs of salvation. But look at what God said about Jesus. And that's very important. And of the angels, he says, who maketh his angel spirit and the ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he says, 
Thy throne, O God. This is what God the Father is saying about this Jesus. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Its scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God has anointed you with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. They all shall wax old as does a garment, and as a vesture shall thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same. And thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said ye at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make your enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? I want you to know that the entire chapter had noted that unto the Son he says, Thy throne, O God, even God the Father will refer to him as God. He called him Lord. The Bible said, the scepter of thy kingdom is the scepter of righteousness. In the beginning, you are the one who laid the foundation of the earth so you can see that God himself accredits to Jesus even the creation. Now, you'll be wondering what is the meaning of this? That's to say that there is the mystery of the Godhead, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. They are co-equal. They have existed before time. They have never stood against one another. They are perfectly one. What does that now require? And the requirement which I wanted to mark is that chapter 2 verse 1. So therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which you have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep. Now, because this is God's revelation, because Jesus is the one by whom God is speaking to us, what are we supposed to do? We ought, therefore, to give the more earnest heed. Now, before I go away from this, let me refer you to come back again to Colossians chapter 1. And again you will see how the word of God was introducing this Jesus. And I want you to come with me very quickly on to verse 12, Colossians chapter 1. And I would like to read from verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, if you look at that, particularly those of you that carry the Old King James Version, you will notice that from that verse 12, when he said to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. If you carry an old King James Version, you will notice that in front of that verse 13, there is a full column. Not a full stop, but a full column. Wherever you see a full column, that means everything else we are going to be saying is but an explanation or an expansion or a definition of what we have just said. So he said when he said into the kingdom of his dear son, I see the question is who is this son? Who is this Jesus? Who is this son that you are talking about? And that's what that full colon was standing for in that particular Bible verse. And so I want you to see how we will go on right now 
looking at who is this Jesus? He said, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. That is, this Jesus, it is in him we have redemption. There is no redemption in any other place. And permit me to say to you, there is no redemption in money. None of you can pay anything to redeem your soul. And don't be confused and say, yes, there is a charge you can pay to redeem your son. That is a false doctrine and you must not fall into it. In whom we have redemption. Even the forgiveness of our sins. So take note, it is in this Jesus that you have redemption. And this redemption through his blood. The blood that is shed at Calvary. Even the forgiveness of sins. Nothing else can blot away our sin. Nothing else can forgive sin. Tears cannot do it. Penance cannot do it. Human punishment cannot do it. The only thing that can bring forgiveness is the blood of this Jesus in whom we have redemption. You know, at the end of verse 14, it was not a full stop because we have not finished. So he went ahead, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. So let's take note of this. So when we say this Jesus, we are talking about the first of every creature. And he is the image of the invisible God. Now, for by him were all things created, things that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and what? And for him. So take note of this. All things were created by him. Whether there are things in heaven, whether there are things on earth, whether things visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. So I want you to see the universality of this Jesus. I want to see his authority, that it is not a limited authority. His jurisdiction, look at it, whether things that are in heaven, so all things created that are in heaven, all things created that are in earth, all things created that are visible, and those that are invisible, so even the things that are invisible, that eyes have not seen and eyes cannot see, if they were created, they belong to him. Whether they be thrones, whether they be dominions, that's why all thrones, all dominions, all kingship, all kingdoms, and anybody that sits on any throne, they can only do so if they are not misbehaving in consonance with him. Because all thrones belong to him. All dominions belong to him. All principalities belong to him. All powers belong to him. All things were created by him and for him. So this Jesus is not a mere man. This Jesus is not just a religious leader. Please take note of that. This Jesus is the owner of all things. When we follow Jesus, we are not following a religion. We are following the Lord. We are following the owner of all things. That's why you can't compare Jesus with any other religious leader at all. All other religious leaders, all of them, all together, they were created by him and for him. For any of them to become object of worship, and you are not worshipping Jesus, you are worshipping the created. You are following the created. And you are ignoring the creator. So let's take note of that. 
you will again notice that at the end of verse 16, you still have a full column. I seem to say that even that which we have said is not exhaustive. We have not finished. We still need to see a little more about him. And even though we want to see more and more and more and more and more of him, we can't see all of him. We can only keep exploring. We will study Jesus from now till eternity. The reason is that he is never fading. You can never be over familiar with him. He is new every morning. He is fresh all the time. Whatever he reveals of himself to you, as wonderful as it is, wonderful, there will be much, much, much more, infinite, infinitely much more of him that you are here to see. That's why all those that are reasonable, all those that have worked with God in their lifetime, they have individually come to understand that this Jesus is a study for life. This Jesus is one to follow from everlasting to everlasting. Now, I want you to go again to that verse 17. And he is before all things. And it is by him all things consist. Philip's mother English says, Jesus existed before everything else began. Jesus is the first principle and he is the upholding principle of the scheme of creation. Everything in the world. So you see, as I talk about Jesus, Jesus as a person, Jesus as the principle for living, Jesus as the principle for the scheme of creation. So when you want to know how to do anything, you look to Jesus. When you want to operate anything and it will go well, you need to look to Jesus. So Jesus is completely inexhaustible and completely applicable everywhere. And so as we begin this study, never you imagine that we are going to become parochial. Never you imagine that we are going to be outmoded. Let nobody confuse you as if there's something modern that you need to know that we are not letting you know by focusing on Jesus. Everything that you need to know that makes for life, that will provide for you everything you need to succeed in every endeavor, whether in academics or in business or in family life or anywhere, all of it is in Christ Jesus. He said, by him, all things consist. By him, everything finds their proper place. If you pick that verse 17 from good news, Christ existed before all things. And in union with him, all things have their proper place. If your life is going to have its proper place, if you are going to become what God wants you to be, then it will be important that you must be properly united to him. And he is the head of the body, the church, with the beginning, the first one from the dead, that in all things, in all things, he might have the preeminence. For he pleased the Father that in him, in Jesus Christ, should all things dwell. Now, let's return back to our passage that I started with, Matthew 11 verse 28 says, Come unto me. I began by noting that he is the one that has the audacity. He has the boldness. He has the will with that to say, Come unto me. Not some of you. Say, All of you that are laboring and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. He speaks authoritatively because he is able to so do. When he say, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy lady, I will give you rest. It is because, honestly speaking, he has all it takes to settle your case. He has all it takes to bring you to rest. He has all it takes to settle every issue about you. 
The reason is because there is nothing that has happened to you that he did not know the origin of it. Because he existed before all things else. So there's no challenge you are facing that Jesus needs to do a research about before he will discover it. He knows everything and everything. So when he says, come, I will give you rest. You may have come to people. You may have gone to pastors. You may have gone to programs. You may have gone to prophets. But they have not helped you because you have not come to him. Come unto me. All he that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. How can he say I will give you rest? Because he can give you rest. Because he has all it takes to give you rest. There is no one who has ever come to him and Jesus said, oh, let me try. And after he has tried, he said, well, your own case is more than what I can do. There's nothing like that. When you come to Jesus, there is no other referrer that you can get. Jesus is the last bus stop. If in the language of the medical people, Jesus is the last referral point. All cases are referred to him, and no case is referred from him to anywhere else. To who else shall we go? That is what the brethren say in John chapter 6. Let me ask you to read John chapter 6. Because you need to know who this Jesus is. When several people were going away from Jesus, as if they are somewhere else to go, and Jesus turned to his 12 disciples, those that have been with him, he asked them. And look at what he asked them in verse 67. He said, Then Jesus said unto the 12, Will you also go away? Because you see, following this Jesus, is voluntary. When you are sure who you are, you don't beg men to follow you. You don't drag men to follow you. When you are sure of who you are, when you are sure of what you carry, when you are sure of the kind of person God has made you, you don't beg for followership. So I saw Jesus, he said, come to me, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me. You will find rest for your soul. My yoke is easy, my body is light. But do you see, he said to them, will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Where else? Which other did Father? If you don't finish it for me here, where else do I go? When you have seen this Jesus, then you will know that he is the first and the last. He is the Alpha and the Omega. Every issue ends on his table. Every challenge must end at his feet. And if you are hearing me, I want you to rise by yourself and say, Now, I want to come to him. I want to get to know him. I want to get to relate with him. I don't want to touch others. I don't want to be in between. I want to meet him myself. He said, Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and we are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered, Have I not chosen you to help? And one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Now, call unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. What does that imply? But I want you to know that when he said, take my yoke upon you, he quickly defined it. It's not the yoke of bondage. It's not the yoke of taskmaster. It's not the yoke of oppressors. It's not the yoke of those who want to drain you 
and take the best, take the benefit of your life at the expense of your progress. No, there's nothing that he said you should take his yoke upon you for. He simply said, you shall find rest unto your souls. My yoke is easy and my body is light. So when he asks you to come to him, he actually asks you to come to him for your own personal benefit. So when we say we are following Jesus, let me put it to you. We are following Jesus not because we can benefit Jesus. Not because we can add anything to him. If he takes anything from you, he has only given you a privilege to be relevant. It's not as if there's something that is lacking in Christ. That you are the one who is going to bring it. And he says, oh, thank you for bringing it to me. No. If he gives you a space to do anything for him, he has only given you a space. He has only allowed you to be relevant, to be useful. So when he says, come to me, it is for your benefit. It is for your own benefit. And when we come to dealing with what would that mean? What is the kind of discipleship that Jesus is offering us? You again discover that it is for your benefit. It is not the discipleship of a taskmasters. It is not that kind of thing that somebody is hanging over your neck and is trying to possess you. No. No. It's not the kind of every shepherd where somebody is holding your neck and is prying into your privacy. No. But this is because you will find rest unto your soul. Now, can I now bring you to a conclusion of what I have been beginning to say as you start your study and as you begin to explore Jesus? Now, why must we put attention to this Jesus? Why? Now, even though 12 disciples, Jesus had called them, they have even gone to be on full time with him. They have been with him. They have been going in and out with him from the baptism of John. But, association with Jesus, Going up and down with Jesus, Jesus did not take that as sufficient as to assume that these people know who he is. Association, familiarity even with the name of Jesus, and enjoying even his miracle is not a sufficient reason to assume that you know who he is and so what did jesus himself do because i'm looking at christ i'm looking at the passion he had in his heart so when you come to matthew 16 all of you please let's go together to matthew 16 verse 13 and when jesus came into the course of caesarea philippi he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now, you'll be wondering, these people have been with Jesus, they have been traveling with him, they have heard him preach, this is chapter 16, but by chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, he has sat down to give them what we call the Sermon on the Mount. He has sat down to teach them many things. By chapter 13, he has spent a whole time speaking about the parables of the kingdom, pointing at himself. By chapter 16, he's calling them aside. So, brothers and sisters, why is it that God is calling you aside to come and study Jesus and give you a fresh focus? Even if you are apostles, even if you have gone out to cast out demons in his name before. Even if you have been involved in faith clinic and you are the one chasing all the demons everywhere. Look at the word of God here. Jesus still called them aside. When Jesus came into the courts of Caesarea Philippi, 
He asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Brothers and sisters, one of the critical problems that are found now in the body of Christ is the vagueness of the believers about their knowledge of Christ. Sometimes you are suddenly surprised that somebody that you thought had known Christ and he has been working with God suddenly turns. Some that we thought are following Christ, they just suddenly they are going back to Islam. Or you meet some persons, they are in church, but they are asking us to adopt philosophies that are contrary to the word of God. Why is it that scientific analysis is being regarded as something that is averse to the knowledge of Christ? And so you are thinking that it's either this or that. No. All of this is pointing to the fact that there's an omission. And I realized that Jesus did not allow that omission even with the first 12. He called them aside. Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, some say that you are John the Baptist. Some say you are Elijah. And others say you are Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But Jesus took the question further. He said unto them, But whom say you that I am? Whom say you that I am? What's your own personal conviction of me? What's your own personal understanding of who I am? Whom do you yourself say I am? You see, this is very critical now. We are not talking about what others are saying about our Jesus. We are not talking about what other religions are saying about Jesus. We are not even talking about what other pastors have said about Jesus. Whom do you, 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 you say that I am? You have been with me. You are going to be the interpreters of this message tomorrow. Whom do you say I am? Very important. What am I saying here? For any man to be able to interpret and preach the message, and represent Christ in this present world, we cannot presume on how much of him you have come to know. And we cannot take it lightly that you have known Jesus. If the move of God that God is releasing to us, if you are going to be able to function properly in it, if you are going to, by the grace of God, maximize the room that God is making for you to be fruitful in the land, then your knowledge, your personal knowledge of Jesus Christ is going to be critical. Your personal experience of Christ is going to be very, very crucial. He said, but whom say you that I am? Not what others have said. Not what the pastor said. Not what the others are saying. You, you, whom do you say I am? So this means, this has to be personal. It means each one of you, you must show personal commitment. I want to know Jesus. I want to know him for myself. I want to experience him by my own life. I want his word to come into my own life directly. The Bible said. So they began to speak. But before they will open their mouth, Simon Peter spoke. Again, you have heard me saying that I wish Simon Peter had not spoken. I would have loved to hear what each one of them had to say. And again, I want to warn you. There may be some brilliant guys that before we open our mouth, they are already talking, they are already talking, talking, talking. Don't let them block you. You need your own personal knowledge of Jesus. Don't let the big talkatives, don't let them fill the space. Don't let those who are big expositors, don't let them take over and say, yeah, this, that, that, that. No, no, no. Tell him to please keep quiet. I want to hear Jesus by myself. Because he will not be there when you will need to answer that question in your life. So this study is very important because each one of us 
must have a clear understanding of who we believe. The reason why Paul was so strong, he said, I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that what I put in his hand is able to keep. So if every member of our congregation cannot say, I know him whom I have believed, and I know that what I put in his hand is able to keep to the very end, and I'm persuaded, I don't need anybody to persuade me again, unless we have brethren, brothers and sisters who have their personal, functional, growing knowledge of God, uh, then things are not going well yet. He said, so Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I don't want to go beyond that. Because I realized that even though Simon Peter said that, when you go to chapter 12, I mean chapter 14 of John, all of you go to John chapter 14, you will see a scenario. And unfortunately, this was at the tail end of the ministry of Jesus. This was at the tail end of his time with them. In fact, they were taking the final last supper together when this question arose. Jesus was already giving them the valedictory speech. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God and believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know. And the way, you already know it. He was speaking confidently. And I want to thank God for Thomas. I want to thank God that there is a Thomas who cannot keep quiet when he has not known. I don't want you to be bullied onto silence when you have not known him. I want that you will be free. Don't pretend to know him when you have not. Don't be shouted into silence because the other say, yeah, 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 we have got that, let's go on, let's go on. This Jesus wants you to have a personal knowledge of him. He will not bully you into silence. So when Thomas raised his hand in that final, final, final valedictory speech, Thomas said, Lord, we know not where you are going. And how can we know the way? Wow. Wow. If I were a teacher who had been teaching for three years, been with me and Somebody is asking such a very fundamental question. Eh? When I thought he's graduating, is he not going to be frustrating? Are you not going to say, what kind of thing? Your head is just dull. Eh? What have you been here with me? I've been talking, talking, talking. You say you don't know the way. Thomas, brother Thomas, good brother, who never pretends. I will tell her so many brothers who are free, who open their hearts, who say, excuse me, this thing you people are saying, I don't understand it. And I don't think I want to go on unless I get my own personal conviction. With them, we will have more realistic church membership than all those who just keep quiet but they grumble at home. Thomas said, Lord, we know not where you are going. And how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Let me ask you, did you notice that at the instance of Brother Thomas, Jesus was giving us a succinct, a very, very clear, almost in a very one sentence, a complete summary of who he is. And I don't know how many millions of souls have been brought to the faith, brought to Christ, just by this one single statement. 
Do you see that this single statement was like a summary of so many, many, many chapters of the Bible? I'm trusting God that God will be introducing himself to you in such a way that you can understand. Jesus will be speaking to you about himself, to you as an individual, in a way that you can grasp it. He said to him, and all of you just take note that that verse 6, he said, and Jesus says to him, to who? To Thomas. To Thomas. God is going to focus on you as an individual. God is going to speak to you as a person. God is going to focus on you because you are important. Jesus relates with each one of us at our levels. Jesus is concerned not about groups. He's concerned about the individual. Each one of us, we have our names written in his hand. One soul at a time. The heart of the Savior is for the individual. So I want you to know that Discipleship is that we might be able to present every man, every man, perfect in the day of Christ. Every man. Teaching every man. Whether you have to do it house to house, whether you have to do it one by one, every man, until each person, Christ is formed in them. Until each person can stand up and say, this Christ is my own as well. So Jesus says to him, to him. No, you see, there were 12 people there, I suppose, or more. But Thomas said, we don't know where you are going to. Hmm. So Jesus spoke to him. And Jesus said unto him, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If you have known me, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth you know him, and you have seen him. He was speaking to him. While he finished speaking to Thomas, another brother raised his hand. Who is this brother now? Brother Philip. Philip says to him, Lord, show us the father and it will suffice us. Wow, for that one, Jesus was even surprised. Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? So again, you see that it is very important. Jesus did not take it for granted. He wants each person, name by name, to know Jesus. Name by name, one by one, to know him. It's not congregational knowledge we are talking about. As far as God is concerned, it must be made personal. So which means this has to be personal to every one of you. Each one of you must seek that I want to know him. I want to touch him. I want to experience him. I want to grow in his knowledge. So he said, Philip, Abba, you have been with me. You mean you don't know me? Of course, Philip says, sir, it will be sufficient if you just show me the father right now. And he that has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest thou? Then show us the Father. Why are you talking like that? Why are you talking like that? But Philip said, well, I have to talk because I need to know. He said, but do you know that even though Jesus was surprised, he went ahead and answered Philip. Did he answer him? Mm -hmm. Believest thou not that I am in the Father? And the Father in me, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Very, very I say unto you. And then he was speaking to him. He was speaking to him. I won't have time to tell you that even when Jesus rose from the dead and Thomas was not there, and I would say, ah, we saw him, ah, we saw Jesus, ah, we saw him. Thomas said, excuse me, brothers. I'm happy that you say you saw him. I've not seen him. And how can I go with you when I've not seen him? I will not believe until I see him go. 
And I need to see him like this. When he comes, if he's not a ghost, I want to put my finger where the name print was because if he just shows up, I don't expect that the name print will have disappeared. I want to see it. I want to put my hand to where they pierced him. I would like to see where the crown of thorns pierced his head. If it's real, what did Jesus do? The Bible said, eight days after, after Jesus had even said bye-bye to them and said, I have sent you into the world just as the Father sent me, he came back again. Why did he come back? He came back for Thomas. And as he came back, he said, Thomas, come out here. Reach out your hand here. That's the concern of Jesus for every one of us. When brother Peter went back to the riverside, did you know that Jesus came back again? And he came back for Peter, not for all of them. He just called Peter aside. He just said, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than this? So what is the matter I'm raising? As great as Jesus is, he has passion for the individual soul. He has passion for each one of us. He wants to walk with me in the way I can walk with him. He wants to bring me up until I know him, until I can walk with him. And so as I draw you to the place of prayer, let it be known to all of you that this Jesus wants to be known by individual voice. This Jesus is eager that you get to know him. I described him the way the word of God has shown him to us. But I'm ending on the fact that as great as he is, he wants to be your personal friend. He wants to walk with you. He wants you to ask him questions, even if it looks a silly question, he's willing to answer. There's no question that he will not answer if you come from a genuine heart. When Thomas said, we don't know where you are going, we don't know the way, how can we even know the way? He came and gave him an answer. When he said, no, if I don't see where they nailed him and put my hand there, I'm not going to believe him. He came back and he gave him opportunity of touching him. Of course, Jesus said, do you now believe? He said, yes, sir, my Lord and my God. He said, you believe because you have seen. Hmm. Blessed are those who believe even though they did not see. That's all right. Those who can believe even when they don't see, we thank God for them. But there are also some of us that we will believe when we have touched him. And he did not separate them. So as we call on God together today, I pray that the Holy Spirit will walk with you. So let's now conclude. We are going to conclude with two passages. And I'm going to read it from the Amplified Versions. I want us to read John chapter 17, verse 2 and verse 3. I want to start with King James and then we'll read Amplified. For you have given him authority over our flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now let me share with you, that God has given Jesus all authority over all flesh, and has given that authority to give eternal life to as many as will come to him, as many as the Father will give to him. But when we talk of eternal life, eternal life, eternal life, eternal life, some of us are very vague about it. What is this eternal life? Jesus said, and this is eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So if you are going to actually grow in this life, if you are going to experience this eternal life the way God has ordained that we will grow in it, then your knowledge of Jesus will be very crucial. Let's read it from the Amplified Bible. This is eternal life. It means to know, to perceive, to recognize, to become acquainted with, and understand you, the only true God and real God, and likewise, in the same way, to know Him. To know Him. Jesus, 
as the Christ the anointed one to draw eternal life. To draw the life, the abundant life that Jesus Christ offers. This abundant life, you will know him more and more. You will grow, you will swim in it the more you get to know him. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 and verse 3. Now, let me pick that quickly for us to note now. If any of you, you are looking for God's favor and peace, which is perfect well-being, all necessary good, all spiritual prosperity, and freedom from fears and agitating passions and moral conflicts. These are all that people made topics, topics, topics. This is what we call topics or sermons. But look at the word of God saying, perfect well-being, all necessary good, all spiritual prosperity and freedom from fears and agitating passions and moral conflicts will be multiplied to you. But how? In the full, personal, precise, and correct knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. All that is needed, requisite and suited to life and godliness, God has bestowed it to us, but it will only come through your full, personal, precise, accurate knowledge of Him who has called us by and to His own glory and excellence. So, my brothers and sisters, I want you to know that it is in this that all perfect well-being will come to you. It has to grow in this that all necessary good will begin to flood your life, flood your family, it will flood your soul. All spiritual prosperity, all spiritual prosperity because it is when your soul prospers that your body will prosper. All freedom from fears and agitating passions and moral conflicts. They will come to you, not little by little. They will be multiplied to you. They will come to you in multiples. But it will come in the full, personal, precise, and correct knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. So when Paul said, my determined purpose is that I may know him. But you see, men of old... Who experienced God seriously, they made this their central focus. That is what they were looking for. Please go with me to Philippians chapter 3. Let's read from verse 7 up to verse 10. And then I will ask everyone to rise in the place of prayer. Whatever was important to me that I thought were again, I have now come to realize that there is one combined loss. For Christ's sake, in the hope that, if possible, I may attain to the spiritual and moral resurrection that leads me out from among the dead, even while in the body. Now may the Lord grant you this kind of hunger. You will see that everything that God will want to release to your life, may it become a personal hunger. May it become something that you yourself are saying, I want to know him. I want to see the priceless advantage of getting to know him. The supreme and the surpassing world, the overwhelming preciousness of knowing Jesus, my Lord. I want to say to you from my own little experience, that actually, actually, there's nothing else that can quantify what you gain as you start learning Christ. So as I pray with you, I commend you to the Lord. I commend each one of you to his mighty hand and his grace. That this will be a great adventure for each one of you. A great experience, an encounter of the living and risen Christ. And that each one of your life will be flooded, will be flooded with God, flooded with His grace. And that we will see a transformed community, a transformed congregation, people that are sprouting, sprouting, sprouting with the life of Christ. 
and that each one of you will become a living witness of his resurrection. You will be able to live the resurrection life. You yourself will be able to walk in the resurrection life, say, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That that resurrection power will be at work in each one of you. It will operate in your homes. It will operate in your works, in your businesses, in your offices. It will operate in your relationship. It will operate everywhere you go. So as I ask you, but the first request, come to me. I say you have gone to many things. And some of you say, I came to him, but you've not come to him. You come to meetings, you come to programs, you go to people, you go to pastors, you go to preachers, you go to prophets and prophetesses, you go everywhere else. But honestly speaking, you have not come to him. When you come to him, something will happen to you. The woman with the issue of blood said, if only I can just touch the hem of his garment. The moment she did, the issue stanched. You can't say you have come to him and you are still heavy laden. How will you have come to Jesus, the Savior, and you are still laden with sin? How will you say you have come to Jesus and say you call his name Jesus for he will deliver his people from their sin? And you are still, you know, under the bondage of sin and addiction. You've not come to him. That is the only answer. If you come to him, something will happen to you. When the blind man saw Jesus, when the blind man blind Bartimaeus said, Jesus, Jesus, have mercy on me, God opened his eyes. When the cripples saw him, they started to walk. If you will see Jesus and come to him today, everything that cripples you, they will give way. He will give you rest. So permit me to ask all of us to please arise in prayer. And as we are going to pray together for this moment, I want you to say to him, Lord, I'm coming to you. I want to know you. I want to become acquainted with you. I want to become intimately acquainted with you. I don't want secondhand knowledge of you. I don't want what others are saying. Eh? Jesus said, what do men say about me? But he said, but you, you, what do you yourself say about me? And he was giving time to every one of them. Thomas had to ask his own question. Philip had his own question. Several of them, even Peter, had time to sort out his own doubt, to weep his own tears out. Every one of them. He called them name by name. You remember there was a John that was putting his head on his breast and he didn't drive him away. Because Jesus is a people person. Jesus wants to relate with you as an individual. Can you pray this morning and say, Lord, I want to come to you. I want to share intimacy with you. I want to experience your life. I want to become acquainted with you. I want to go beyond general Sunday Sunday activity. I want to walk with you. Lord Jesus, draw me nearer. Jesus, please draw me nearer. I want you to pray that prayer. I want you to personally, because I perceive that this is a new season. Rehoboth has been declared unto us all. And yet for you to maximize this, for you to make the most of this season, God is saying, there is one to know. It is Jesus. Do those who do know their God. The Bible said they will be strong and they will do exploits. But how dare we release any of you to go and you have not had a grip of him with whom you can travel. How dare we say you are not going to have a problem when you are not holding on to him who is the refuge of us all. When you do not know him personally, somebody will just come with a question and will sweep you off. This is the time to say, Lord, that I may know you. Lord, 
I want to know you. I want to experience you. I want to touch the reality of your power. Thank you, we are praying. I'll pray for you right away. But before I go on praying, he said, come to me, all ye that labor, all ye that struggle, all ye that are heavy laden, all ye that are struggling under some weight. And the Bible talks of weights. Say, let us lay aside every weight and the sin. Wait, wait, that have come and subdued you and you have almost agreed that that's the way to manage until you will die. No, come unto me, I'll give you rest. You are hearing the Lord say, come to me. Stop going to people. Just bring yourself as you are. Tell me as it is with you. Let's settle the matter. I want to give you that chance as we pray together. And the first thing I wanted to do, because I said, come to me. Oh my God. Please take one step out and say, I'm coming to him. I'm coming to him. It doesn't matter what others are thinking. That's not your business. Everybody is praying their prayer. I want to know him. I want to be like a Thomas who can ask a question out of a whole congregation and say, but I don't know the way. And give Jesus a chance to answer you. God bless you. So I will request everyone that wants to take that step this morning. Can you please lift up your right hand. And as you are lifting up your right hand, my brother, my dear sister. It's not a matter I've been in church for many years. That's not the question. This year is a year of a turning point. It's a year of a new beginning. And God is offering us the sumptuous blessing of a time. If you are there and you are saying, Yes, Lord, I want to come to you. I want to know you. I want to experience you. I don't want to be secondhand anymore. I want this weight in my life to be dropped. I want this sin that has been my trouble, I want it to end here. I want Jesus to be Jesus in my life. I want Jesus to be the great physician of my own life too. I want the resurrection life of Jesus to become the life I'm carrying out of here. I don't want to be living a general life that everybody is saying up and down, eh? today up, tomorrow down, today up, tomorrow down. I don't want that anymore. Lord, draw me near. Where are you? I want to pray for all the hands that are lifted, all the ones that are taking a step, all those who are saying, my determined purpose is to know him. My cry is to experience Him. My desire is to walk in His reality. Thank you, God bless you. Thank you. If you really need deliverance, you need God to help you, this is the hour to come out. You don't procrastinate meeting Jesus. You don't go ahead taking presumptuous step and say, I will go or maybe I will eventually. It's not like that. If you are there and the Spirit of God is saying, but today is the day I will ordain for you. Today is the day I have ordained for your life to turn around. For this weight of your life to go, come along, come quickly before I pray. I want to pray right now. Let me not hear that the Lord came and you managed to escape his hand. That sister, thank you, step out. Is there someone else who must come before I pray? Is there someone else? The Holy Ghost is saying, step out there. Step out there, that brother, come out. And say, Lord, here am I. Eh? What is the use of a Christianity that does not release you? You are not released. You are not free. You are struggling inside. Is that the kind of life you want to live? Step out quickly and say, Lord, it was end. Now I'm praying because time is finished for me. If you are not out, you need to run quickly and get on your knees. God bless you. Is there someone else that ought to do that? Because it's not a respect of persons. What I'm asking God to do today, He will do it. When we ask Him to give you rest today, you will enter into rest. When we ask Him to break that yoke today, He will break it. Because He said, whatever you ask in my name, along the lines of what I'm doing, I will do it. Thank you. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, 
You have said that whosoever comes to you, you will in no wise cast out. When you use the word no wise, that means no matter how, no matter the situation, no matter the conflict, no matter the problem, no matter how long it has lingered. Father, because he said they will call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Lord, I ask that with our hands stretched upon your people and all those that have taken steps to come to you, please, Father, honor your word on their lives. Every weight, every weight, every load on their lives, every inconveniences, everything that has come, much of it in the secret place, the kind that they bear and nobody knew. This particular day caused that weight to drop off. Release them and give them rest this hour. Rest from the power of sin. Rest from the threat of Satan. Rest from every form of addiction. Rest from every hindrance unto growth. Give them rest from this hour as you have promised us in the name of Jesus. Lord, I ask, some, I say, I've been a Christian for long. They came to Christianity, but they've not come to you yet. They have been in fellowship, but they've not met the man of Calvary. Oh God, as many as are crying out and say, Lord, this must mark a turning point for me. I'm going to with a fresh commitment, a fresh intimate communion with God. Lord, let it be so. Thank you, Lord, for hearing this prayer. I'm asking, oh God, that as we all stand in the place of prayer and we are taking a decision that we want to see Jesus, Lord, I ask that you will reveal yourself to us. Reveal yourself to my brothers and sisters. Let your presence walk into their individual lives, individual homes, individual situations in the name of Jesus. Lord, I ask that your word will continue to break forth upon us day by day. And the power of the Holy Spirit will continue to reveal Christ in his glory in our lives, in our hearts. But more than that, until we are transformed into his own likeness, from one degree of glory to another by the working of the Holy Spirit, Lord, we ask that this will be the result of this. Thank you for this morning. As they go, O oh God, into their different businesses in the course of the week, and the course of this year, Father, go ahead of them. I ask, Lord, that you open doors unto each one of us. Cause all that you have ordained and you have kept in store, let them begin to be released to your children. Let each one of them begin to have their testimonies in the name of Jesus. Oh God, about expecting parents, we beg you that in this year, open wounds that have been closed. Speak into barrenness. Let them yield up unto fruitfulness. Say, so we have come to a level but we shall be fruitful in the land. Every barrenness of any kind, physical, spiritual, mental barrenness, intellectual barrenness, all those kind of barrenness that keep people stagnant in life, we bring healing unto them right now in the name of Jesus. We speak into each of your life today. You will walk out rejoicing. You go from one degree of glory to another, the Lord Almighty will bring unto you what he has kept in store for your lives. Thank you, Lord, for hearing us. In Jesus Christ's name, we have prayed. hearing the Lord again, speaking unto me personally, again, he's saying, come unto me, come unto me. And this call is unto each and every one of us. I know when the Lord is drawing us and calling us, it is for our own good. You know, I took a note here, he said, when we're following Jesus, uh, it is not because we will we, we add anything to him. It is for our own benefit. 
it even if he has given us opportunity to put anything into what he's doing it is because he wants us to have relevance even in his plan and purpose he doesn't need you and i to be god that he is and so when he's drawing us even unto him closely uh, so that he can pour his life unto us so that we may get to know him it is for our own benefit and this is why uh, this message is coming to us at this time that we need to give earnest heed even unto Jesus, even to knowing him. You know, many times we know about him, but we don't know him. Uh, association with Jesus, uh, walking around Jesus is not synonymous to knowing him. You know, despite the fact that the apostles, the, the disciples, they've been following the Lord. Jesus was very particular about whether they know him personally. You know, he started with a teaser question and said, who do men say I am? And eventually nailed it down and said, who do you say I am? You, you, you. And I hear the Lord saying, speaking that even unto my heart again, you know, inquiring of you and I to look into what is the status of our intimate knowledge of him. Have you only come to the church and we have not come to him? Have you only come to religion and we have not come to him? Have you only come to Christianity and we have not come to him? And you know, the issue is that it is when we have come to him that we can actually get to know him. Even if you are planning and you are hoping and you are desiring to know God, it is when you come to Jesus he himself is the express image of God. I want to encourage us, men and brethren, as we pray together and close, uh, you know, at this moment, that we take this matter seriously. You know, we have been going through the beatitude, and God has been speaking to us in diverse ways in different aspects of the kingdom lifestyle. All that we're learning is actually the lifestyle of Jesus. And it is important for us to actually, uh, you know, give heed to this instruction. You know, the title of this message is Giving Attention Unto Jesus. It's important for us to give attention, you know, so that it will not just be a routine of coming every Saturday, we are past this topic, we are moving to another topic. We must keep this in mind that Jesus is the one that we are learning. I pray that the Lord will help us, that we will not be distracted with different other things, but that we will put our gaze and our eyes on Jesus. We want to take a quick announcement before we pray and close. At first, I want to say that as many of us who have uh, you know, signified by raising up your hand, whether by Zoom or physically, if you have a need for any counseling, uh, please uh, reach out to you know, all our brethren, our leaders in the different regions. Uh, they will be more than happy to help you in supporting you in your quest for God in knowing him. Uh, we have a, a, a facility for you know, counseling online, and you can reach out to our leaders in different uh, regions uh, by the grace of God. So please, do not just uh, respond to this call and keep it to yourself. If you have any need for counseling, prayer, or any area of challenge that you need support in, uh, feel free to reach out to our brethren all across uh, you know, uh, the nations where we are represented. Um, the book that we have been studying, The Kingdom Lifestyle, uh, is available on Kindle, uh, on online in Amazon Kindle, and we have physical copy in different of uh, all, all other areas of our offices too. You can request art copies from our representative in different areas. Uh, but if you want art copies, I mean soft copy, you can download online. We will be resuming back to this uh, next week by the grace of God. Um, also, as we continue, I like to also highlight that um, if you need any counseling, please. I already mentioned that you can log on online 
and someone will be ready to connect with you. And if it's that you want to actually speak to someone, you can reach any of our leaders in different uh, regions. We have also uh, different contacts in Belize. You can see them on the screen in Canada, in the US, in the UK, and in Nigeria. You can you know, visit our website. Uh, you have all the information on the screen and you can get them. Um, we also want to know that this Bible study continues every Saturday. By God's grace, we will be uh, connecting again next week, Saturday. Um, also, I need to note to us concerning the daylight savings. Uh, for us in the West uh, side here, we have, we have moved the hand of the clock forward. And so the time of this Bible study is no longer uh, the 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time that we used to have. Um, it's now at 11 a.m. So please, let's take note of that. Um, please, and, and adjust accordingly. It's not going to be 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time again. Starting from this Saturday is 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, thank you very much. I think that's about it for all the announcement. We thank the Lord for how the Lord has helped us. Shall we turn to the Lord in prayer as we uh, close today? I'd like us to take a moment to uh, still speak to the Lord on what the Lord has spoken to us. You know, um, Thomas was not a, a pretender. Thomas said clearly that, look, I don't know the way. And Philip said, you know, I don't know the Father. Show us the Father. You know, these are people that have been following Jesus for a while. And I know that many of us here on this line, we have been in the church. Many of us, we have been Christians. We have been following many for many years. But the question is, do we really know him? If you are among the people here that your state is the state of Thomas, can you talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I really don't know the way. There's no need to pretend. Say, Lord, I don't know the way. Show me, show me, show us the way. And if you are the one that you have not known the Father, it's a time for you to cry out and say, Lord, show me the Father. And you know, Jesus will be very, very careful even to attend to you personally because he wants us to know him. Shall we ask that the Lord will help us that we will not just be associating with Jesus and not know him. That we will not just be coming to church and not coming to Christ. That we will be deliberate in our pursuit. We will be deliberate in our following. We will remain focused on Jesus. We will focus on knowing him personally, not even for anything, but intimately just for our own lives. We will be like the Berean Christians, that we take time even to search the scripture, that we take time even to look intently into the word of God. Shall we ask the Lord that the Lord will help us, he will grant unto us even the grace to be, to be, to be students of the word of God, to know him intimately that it will help us that we will not be distracted by other affairs of life, but we will focus on Jesus as we continue to follow him. Father, we thank you, Lord. We give you praise. Lord, we thank you, Father, Lord, for today, for how you have helped us, O oh God, in bringing this message away, giving attention unto Jesus. You want us to focus on Jesus. Lord, we pray, O oh God, against any form of distraction in our way, whether internal agitation, anxiety, worry, Lord, that distract us, O oh God, from following and learning the life of Christ. Lord, help us to remain focused on Jesus in the name of Jesus. Help us to keep coming, Lord. Every day that we keep coming, oh God, to the throne of grace, you say, let us therefore come boldly even to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You have given us this open invitation. Help us to leverage this open invitation all the time in the name of Jesus. And as we come, oh God, help us to focus on Jesus, learning of him, becoming more and more like him in the name of Jesus. 
Thank you, Father Lord. We give you praise. We worship your name. Lord, we ask, oh God, that as we continue in this week, continue to, Lord God, even brood over this word in our heart in the name of Jesus and bring us back next week, even to continue in your presence in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father Lord. We give you praise. We worship your name. In Jesus' precious and wonderful name, we pray. Amen and amen. Shall we share the grace in fellowship as we unmute our phones together, our devices? May the grace, grace of our Lord, 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 Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. 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 Amen.